Okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I feel like this is, it's very apropos that, um, that the net zero energy city conversation is coming on the heels of uh, Jules uh, conversation in particular about some of the trends that we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis energy transformation. I think our panel um, will embody some of the work that is happening at the local level. Um, so again, this is uh, Next Year Energy Cities Charging Ahead, aka uh, Burlington and its transition uh, to net zero energy in the thermal and transportation sectors and our um, ambitious goal of transitioning off of fossil fuels in those sectors. So um, welcome everyone, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you. Uh, my name is Jennifer Green and I am the Director of Sustainability and Workforce Vitality at BED. And I'm here today with our three panelists, with Darren Springer. Uh, Darren, as many of you know, is the general manager of Burlington Electric and formerly the manager of strategy and innovation um, at BED. It's really a pleasure uh, to work with Darren and have Darren at the helm. Um, our net zero energy roadmap, which you'll hear about in detail, was conducted by Synapse Energy Economics with the help of Resource Systems Group. And to that end, we have Asa Hopkins, who's here. Asa is uh, vice president of uh, Synapse Energy Economics and also a regulatory and policy expert in energy and GHG emissions. Um, and sitting next to Asa, Asa is um, a local personality, uh, Jonathan Slayson. <laughs> Jonathan, <laughs> sorry, I wanted to say, <laughs> RSG has an office here in Burlington, so i um, really happy that um, we were able um, through a synapse to subcontract with a, with a local firm. So uh, Jonathan has um, I, probably the, the most fun and interesting title. I think um, you're the director of future mobility planning for RSG. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what we have on the, on the docket. Um, we're going to start with an introduction. Darren will kick us off, um, framing up the conversation with some background information on BED, Burlington Electric, um, and Burlington Electric as a municipal utility. And then we'll talk about some of the high-level roadmap findings, um, again, conducted by uh, Synapse in conjunction with RSG. Um, then I'm going to kick it over to Asa, who will talk a little bit about um, the findings vis-a-vis uh, -vis buildings in the roadmap, including some of the action items that we're going to need to take, the challenges and opportunities of those action items as well that are going to help us in the built environment in particular. And then um, uh, Jonathan will take the stage with an eye on transportation, and in particular, again, some of the tools that were used and the findings more specifically vis-a-vis -vis transportation and some of the action items we'll need to, to take to move us to uh, net zero energy in that sector. And then uh, Darren will come back up, tell us a little bit about some of the new programs and initiatives, um, some of which were launched uh, pre-roadmap and some were, which were launched in conjunction with in our effort to really um, hit the ground running. And then we'll take questions. Okay, so thanks, Darren. All right. Turning it over to you. Okay. All right, hello. Oops. You get that there. All right, hello everybody. Um, I just wanna say at the outset for Burlington Electric, uh, it's been a real pleasure to be able to work with Synapse and with RSG on this roadmap exercise. Um, this has been going uh, really for uh, something that we were talking about in 2018 in terms of putting it together, went in our fiscal 19 budget and was completed uh, and released in September. So this is a relatively new document. You can read it uh, on Burlington Electric's website, burlingtonelectric.com slash NZE. Uh, for net zero energy. So any of the things we're discussing here, uh, you can check out on the website. Um, I think folks are, are familiar with Burlington Electric, but uh, just in case there are some who are not, uh, we are the third largest uh, utility, electric utility in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have been a public power utility since 1905, have roughly 118 employees. Uh, we uh, operate the McNeil uh, biomass plant uh, in the Intervale along with uh, or, or with uh, two joint owners, uh, GMP and VEPSA. Uh, we are an owner of that plant. Uh, McNeil is the largest energy producer in the state of Vermont now that Vermont Yankee has closed. Um, and we have been uh, going since 2009 without a rate increase. So we're coming into our 11th year now uh, having not raised rates. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about us. We have. Uh, about three quarters of our customers residential, about a quarter commercial, uh, but that's actually 
pretty much flipped on its head when you look at our electricity use. It's largely commercial. Uh, roughly a quarter of it is residential. And uh, somewhat unique for the state of Vermont, 60% of our residential customers are renters. Uh, we have a number of renters, student population. Uh, so we have some unique uh, dynamics in terms of uh, our service territory relative to others. We serve the city of Burlington and the Burlington Airport. Uh, we are an energy efficiency utility. Everybody knows about Efficiency Vermont, uh, and also Vermont Gas is an energy efficiency utility. Burlington Electric is an energy efficiency utility. Uh, this is a picture from our energy efficiency calendar contest, which I think this year we're going to rename the Net Zero Energy uh, Calendar Contest. Um, that's uh, myself and the mayor and Mark Stevenson from Vermont Energy Contracting and Supply. I think they've got a booth back there. Uh, he's a, been a sponsor, and they've been a sponsor of this contest. And of course, Champ, who's the most famous uh, celebrity in the city of Burlington, Lake Monsters, um, joined with us with all of these uh, fourth graders from public schools around the community who compete each year uh, to have their picture about energy uh, included in this calendar. So it's a nice, a nice event for us. Um, we've been working on energy efficiency as a community dating back at least to the 1980s. Uh, we had a bond for energy efficiency in 1990. Uh, that was an $11.3 million bond, uh, major investment uh, at the time, and uh, kicked off roughly $70 million of investment between Burlington Electric and our customers over the last several decades. At this point, we're saving our customers roughly $12 million annually on electric bills in terms of avoided costs. Uh, so there's a significant payback associated with efficiency. Uh, most notably, in my mind, Burlington as a community is using 6% roughly less electricity today than we were in 1989. Um, if you look at the uh, state of Vermont and the US over that same period, there's actually an increase in electricity consumption. We've seen a decrease. Uh, and if the rest of the US had had a 6% reduction in electricity use as opposed to uh, a roughly 29% increase, uh, that's equivalent to about 238 coal plants worth of electricity annually uh, that we could be saving as a country. So, that energy efficiency accomplishment is, is quite significant and is really the foundation for our work uh, on net zero energy. Uh, we also were recognized in 2014 as a community for being the first city in the nation to source 100% of our electricity from renewable generation. Uh, here you can see two different uh, pie graphs. Uh, one is uh, lists our different resources, uh, roughly a third biomass, uh, about a third hydro, both large and small hydro, uh, Vermont and out-of-state hydro. Uh, three different wind projects that we get power from, uh, including two in Vermont, the Sheffield and Georgia Mountain projects, and then uh, a growing slice of our uh, electricity in the graph on the right coming from solar. Uh, Burlington was named by Environment America just recently as the top community per capita uh, for solar in New England and number four in the country. Uh, we've seen uh, solar was 0.3% of our generation in the 2017 version of this uh, pie graph. And uh, in this slice here, that orange slice is 1.4%, just to give you a sense of the year-on-year -year significant growth of solar uh, in the community. Uh, we both buy and sell renewable energy certificates under Vermont's Renewable Energy Standard. So uh, the pie graph on the uh, far side there is, uh, includes those renewable energy sales and purchases. We're, we remain 100% renewable after all of those transactions are accounted for as well. So after that accomplishment in 2014, um, the mayor of Burlington, Mayor Weinberger, and the Burlington Electric Department and our Electric Commission uh, came together on a goal of becoming a net zero energy city by 2030. And the way we've defined that is to take uh, a goal of reducing and eventually eliminating fossil fuel use, not only for electricity, but also for ground transportation and for heating. Um, and that's the goal that we've embraced. I think it's among the most ambitious local government climate change related goals in the country. Uh, Vermont has a 90% by 2050 renewable goal across those different sectors. Uh, Burlington's looking at a 2030 timeframe, which is much quicker, and looking to achieve the net zero energy uh, goal. So that's something that's uh, exciting for us at, at BED, exciting, I think, for our entire workforce. Um, we were really fortunate to be joined by our chief steward from the IBEW at our Net Zero Energy uh, release uh, earlier in, in September. Uh, this is something that I think from uh, all facets of the company we find to be the right goal to be moving on. So in terms of Net Zero Energy, we realized uh, you know, we needed some data, some analysis to be able to look at what is our current energy use across these different sectors in the city. 
Uh, and what is the pathway to get to this net zero energy goal? Uh, how do we track the metrics? How do we know if we're being successful? And so this, uh, this, this piece here uh, looks at fossil fuel use across uh, the building sector and the transportation sector, ground transportation in Burlington. The portion that's striped represents vehicles that are coming into Burlington, uh, commuters, visitors, non-Burlington resident travel. Uh, and then the, uh, the darkest portion there is transportation from Burlington residents, and then the other two slices are uh, residential and commercial building fossil fuel use. And we decided during the course of the roadmap that we would take primary responsibility for the transportation and fossil fuel use related to that transportation uh, for Burlington residents, as well as the fossil fuel use that's happening in residential and commercial buildings. Uh, we have some tools to help with reducing fossil fuel use from the visitor and commuter population as well, um, but we're taking a primary focus on the transportation uh, both in and out of the city, but the use uh, by Burlington residents. Uh, the reason for that in part is if there are customers, we can offer a different suite of incentives than if they are a visitor uh, to the community. This is uh, both a business as usual and then a net zero 2030 and 2040 uh, chart here. So business as usual, uh, we reach roughly a 9% reduction in fossil fuel use uh, in the sectors targeted by 2030. Um, we're already rolling out and have rolled out a number of programs in Burlington to reduce uh, fossil fuel use. Um, we know there are some supportive trends, uh, particularly in electric transportation, uh, both at the state level, national level, even internationally. We're seeing some progress with some of that. So there's some emissions reduction and some fossil fuel use reduction that's baked into business as usual. The two different green lines uh, represent the 2040 and 2030 uh, tracks uh, for net zero energy. Obviously, the 2030 track is the one that we're targeting. Uh, if we get there quicker, we reduce more emissions, more fossil fuel use than if it takes a longer period of time. Uh, one of the unique challenges for us, however, is a number of the decisions that are being made today are gonna affect um, our ability to su succeed on this uh, time frame. Uh, somebody going out and buying a conventional vehicle today that doesn't have uh, the capability of plugging in, that vehicle could be on the road in 2030, uh, still working. Uh, somebody putting in a new heating system that's a conventional heating system today, that heating system is likely to be operating in 2030. Uh, so the 2040 path is a little bit more of a glide path. The 2030 path, although it's still ambitious, the 2030 path is much more of an aggressive time frame. It envisions that you're going to have to have uh, different types of customer equipment change out programs, you know, cash for clunker type programs, uh, other incentive programs that would be aimed at helping uh, to reach that 2030 time frame. Um, I should also note, that because this was an interesting finding to me in the roadmap, that um, although incentives tend to be a lot of places where we focus uh, policy and uh, attention at, at utility uh, level particularly, uh, regulation is really called out in the roadmap as well, looking at the tools that the city has, uh, both in terms of housing, in terms of land use, in terms of other uh, types of regulations, ordinances, and that's something that we're considering and, and looking at uh, as part of the roadmap process. Uh, this is the reason that we're working on this uh, in large part. Um, I, you know, been a lot of discussion today about climate change, about the climate emergency, about needing to reduce emissions and get on track uh, to meet goals. Um, this is the emissions trajectory uh, if we reach the net zero energy 2030 goal. Um, and this is for the, the heating and ground transportation sectors. So this would be a precipitous drop uh, in emissions in those sectors uh, relative to where we are today. Um, and then this, uh, this is my last uh, piece for right now. This represents the different solutions that we're targeting in the roadmap. Um, because we remove as a primary target the non-Burlington uh, resident transportation piece, buildings takes a primary focus. You can see 60% of the solution uh, really coming in the building sector uh, from additional efficiency, from additional electrification, additional renewable fuels, uh, all making up some portion of the solutions in the building sector. Uh, switching to electric vehicles is 20% of the solution. Um, I would note that economically, uh, switching to electric vehicles is one of the most beneficial steps that we can take as a community. Uh, the roadmap calls that out. Um, we know today that if you charge up with Burlington Electric's 100% renewable electricity at our public charging stations, it's roughly $1.46 a gallon equivalent. Um, if you're charging at home, it's even cheaper than that. And if you're charging with our off-peak rate, it can be 60 cents a gallon equivalent. 
Um, so today, current technology, uh, you can charge up with 100% renewable electricity cheaper uh, than it is to drive with gasoline. Um, and that not only has a great benefit in terms of environmental footprint, in terms of savings for drivers, uh, but it can also benefit all of our ratepayers and customers uh, if we're adding new use to the system and doing so in an efficient way. And we also found out that uh, it's also a really great opportunity to buy local energy. Uh, because if you spend a dollar at the gas station, uh, about 80 cents of that dollar is leaving the state of Vermont's economy. Um, but our estimate is that if you spend a dollar uh, charging a vehicle, for example, uh, with Burlington Electric, more than half of that dollar stays in the Vermont economy and more than three quarters stays in the regional economy. So a lot of times we don't think of energy uh, or electricity in that type of way. But uh, for those folks who are looking at buying local, this is an opportunity for us in Burlington and really for the state uh, to switch from sending money out of state for fossil fuels to keep money in state uh, with electricity. Uh, the last two solutions there are listed, district energy, district heat, uh, something we're working on uh, with our McNeil plant and uh, some stakeholders, uh, including uh, Vermont Gas, UVM Medical Center, UVM, and others. Um, is a key portion of the solution. It's really the single biggest step we could take as a community to reduce emissions, uh, getting waste heat from the McNeil plant and using it for thermal uh, energy use at the hospital and potentially UVM and other buildings uh, around the community. And then 5% uh, of the solution coming from alternative transportation, which Jonathan will touch on, uh, which is really the energy efficiency of the transportation sector, demand management, walking, biking, transit, carpooling, van pooling, all the different things that help us reduce vehicle miles traveled so that when we do uh, need to travel, we're able to do so with electric uh, buses and bikes and cars, but reducing those, the need for those vehicle miles traveled, having last mile solutions is part of that as well. So I am going to pause there and hand it over to Asa for a more detailed look at the building sector. I'll, I'll just start uh, before I dive into the, the technical bits here, saying thank, to, thank you to BED uh, for the opportunity to do this. We learned a lot. I'm glad that you learned a lot as well. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's great uh, personally to be back uh, working for people that I, that I know and like and respect uh, here in Vermont. Uh, so, uh, so I'm glad to be back at REV uh, and uh, here, tell you a little bit about, uh, about buildings. So this is the same slide that Darren just showed, but spread out over time. So, so the, 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 those four chunks are, are there on the right, and I put little brackets by the, by the building sector pieces of it. So uh, <coughs> efficient electric buildings uh, and district energy. So I'll, I'll walk through each of those pieces, but just so you see uh, how they spread out over time, district energy comes on in chunks, where the whole big portion of, of, a, of a system might, might come on at once, uh, and the, the Efficient electric buildings piece is more a matter of stock turnover of, of heating systems uh, getting changed out over time. So, <clears throat> if you start in, in residential buildings, uh, you know, a challenge with a, a goal for 11 years from now uh, is that uh, most heating systems last well more than 11 years. Uh, so, most heating systems that are in uh, Burlington buildings today would still be there in 2030, or maybe it'll be, you know, if it's a 20 year replacement time, half of them would have been replaced between now and 2030. Uh, so, uh, we need to figure out uh, how to get faster replacement. And one, one tool for that is that actually for, for uh, hydronically heated buildings, for, for uh, buildings with boilers, uh, adding a ductless system to that doesn't require you to, it, it, you, it can be entirely separated time-wise from when you would replace your boiler. So you can displace the, the vast majority of your fossil fuel use uh, tomorrow uh, without waiting for the time when the, when the boiler comes. And so that's, that given the, the, the amount of, of hydronic heat in the city, that's actually, that's a really good thing for being able to take much faster action than waiting for systems to turn over. It does mean, however, every time a system turns over, you've got to be there and saying, well, no, actually, uh, let's replace uh, that boiler with a, a, a ground source system or an air source system. Let's replace a furnace uh, with a heat pump and, and, and really be trying to get there in, in, in basically every, uh, every opportunity to, to engage with that. Uh, the, I want to I double down also on the first word of this. We've talked a lot about heating systems and, and the electric part of the, that efficient electric uh, buildings piece, but I want to double down on the efficient part of it as well. Uh, th this, this, this pathway, in order, you know, you could electrify everything and ask BED to go find even more electricity uh, to serve to customers, but actually it makes a lot more sense to, to be really efficient about that and be using that electric heat into a really high performing building shell. Uh, so so uh, we modeled roughly a tripling of the pace of, 
of uh, weatherization of, of uh, air sealing and insulation in the city such that uh, half of the buildings uh, get weatherized uh, by 2030. Uh, <clears throat> you'll notice there's a, uh, so on the, on the chart here, the, the heat pump piece is, is green, the, the black part is, is various fossil fuels. There's a tiny little sliver of electric resistance heat. Um, but uh, the, uh, there's this last little bit there at the end, which is more of the sort of the door-to-door -door campaign. Like, let's try to get those last few units out uh, and, uh, and, 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 and you know, squeeze that last little bit of fossil fuels out of, out of the residential building stock. Uh, there's a typo on the slide. It should say commercial buildings in the upper left. Sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, so in, in commercial buildings, it's again efficiency, electrification, but also district heat, district energy. Uh, so a similar stock turnover story to what's going on in the residential picture. Uh, interestingly, uh, commercial cooking, there's as much uh, natural gas used in Burlington for commercial cooking as for water heating. Uh, and so uh, not only are you thinking about trying to swap out all the water heating systems, you're also thinking about engaging uh, with, with restaurants, with the cafeteria, at the hospital, with UVM, right, on, on what does the, the cooking picture look like uh, for, for, you know, induction, induction cooking and, and other, other technologies to, 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 to get at that piece as well. Uh, again, weatherizing half of the square footage by 2030. Um, and then there, you'll notice this big... Uh, uh, opportunity for district energy. So, so we modeled that as all, basically use a lot, using all of the renewable heat options that have been on the table in the conversation uh, with Corex uh, in, the, in the district energy uh, conversation in Burlington. So that's McNeil, but it's also, so the first chunk basically there is capturing the waste heat from McNeil. And like that would be a, that would be a great thing. You do that, you didn't get the rest, great. You just have to electrify that much more. The green part grows. To, to, to take more of the, what would have been the blue piece. But if you're able to also use uh, uh, like a digester at the wastewater treatment plant and, and, and you know, get heat there, uh, heat, heat, uh, heat pump heat out of the sewer system, et cetera, right, then there's another piece there. We didn't, we didn't bring in other things, you know, uh, water source heat pump out of the lake or you know, whatever other, other ideas might have, might have been out there. We were working with the quantified specific pieces uh, that, are, that are known there. Uh, we did uh, account, uh, and you'll notice here that there's still some fossil fuel heating piece, um, and uh, that's more, uh, think of that as combusting methane molecules piece, uh, because actually uh, the way you get to net zero in the end is you also go talk to Don and make sure that that's, uh, that that's RNG that, that's going into the pipes uh, for those last bits. That's also necessary on the district energy side, uh, where uh, in order to meet peak, meet peak heat needs, uh, you need to be able to fire up some extra boilers, and you want to run those boilers on, on RNG as well uh, to make sure that that whole picture can really be net zero. So, <clears throat> all right, so all this, though, those pathways are great. You're going to, like, everybody just go off and go do that, right? Uh, so, like, the, the city's going to have to actually do stuff uh, to change people's behavior to get dramatically different purchasing behavior, dramatically different behavior about how people choose to spend the, the money they might invest in their homes and, and in their businesses. So <clears throat> we split this out uh, into three time periods uh, over the next 10 years, uh, near term, mid term, and long term. Near term is really pretty near term. If you want to, if you want to split 10 years into three periods, you know one of the periods can be particularly long. Uh, the, uh, uh, the first period is really about uh, priming the pump. That's, this is where uh, incentives, where uh, getting the, the research done, moving, you know, it takes time if you, if you need state legislative change. You know, one of the things we, we mentioned is, you know, evolution in what does it mean to be an energy efficiency utility? Uh, what does it mean to, for, to use tier three? You know, is there, a, is there a sort of a net zero cognizant uh, scaling and role for, for what the regulated energy efficiency world looks like for the utility? Well, that's going to, that means going to the legislature perhaps, means going to the PUC. Those processes take time, so you want to start them now so that they can start to have impact in time to have impact in time to matter uh, by 2030. You, there's not a lot of time for like, well, and then there's a one-year delay. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Uh, there's not a lot of time uh, to make this work. So uh, there, are, there, are, there are things around uh, massively increasing the rate of energy efficiency, uh, pushing those electric options, laying the groundwork for district heat, um, uh, building the groundwork, as I said, for regulatory action, uh, rate design, um, and then uh, the 
transit plan piece that Jonathan will talk about, you know, some of those pieces have to start getting uh, laid in the near term. In the, in the midterm, if you're really talking about replacing basically every system uh, it, it, in, in buildings in, in the city, uh, incentivizing 100% participation with capital intensive inv investments um, is a lot of money to flow through the utility and back right, in, in, in an incentive framework. And this is where we get to the regulatory levers uh, that, that Darren mentioned. Um, you know, talking with the, with the city, zoning, uh, ordinances, uh, performance standards, other things where you say go to, you know, yeah, this, is, this is obviously hypothetical, but go to landlord and say if you want to be a landlord in Burlington, your building has to meet at least this level. And, you know, and it's got to be, uh, you know, no fossil fuels in the building by some date. You can plan for that. You're in business. You can make investments in your building, uh, but but know that that's coming, and know that all your competing landlords for for tenants are doing the same thing, right? So you know, raising raising the bar uh, for everyone. There's going to be a certain amount of things you have to do to bring new technologies in to meet the niche edge cases. So that's where supporting R and D, uh, well, having Burlington be a welcoming place for someone who wants to try out a new kind of heat pump technology uh, or, or some other option that uh, that that meets a need here uh, before 2030, where maybe that technology can scale nationwide, globally in, in the 2030s or 2040s. But you want to be able to get it deployed here because it's going to help get this get the city towards its goal, uh, and also. Uh, bringing financing tools to bear, you know, financing is a good way to to uh, to bring people to the table about investments they might want to make, uh, but which are uh, 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 doesn't necessarily involve the same sort of outlay of of, of say ratepayer money. And by the end period, by this, the the long term, you know, long term, you know, uh, my kids will still be in uh, still be in grade school. Um, the the uh, there, there, you're at the cash for clunkers stage. You're at, you're at buying out equipment, um, and and you're and you're and you're talking about getting RNG for the for the bit that, that you have yet to get to. So in the, in the near term, I, I basically talked through this on the other slide, but uh, um, getting GHG and net zero targets built into the utility programs, which might require uh, working with the state, um, deploying capital to fund additional incentives, as as Darren will talk about, they're already effectively doing. Uh, educating folks, making sure folks are, understand building owners, tenants, uh, uh, commercial and residential building owners about what this is going to mean, benchmarking, labeling, rating, zoning, permitting, getting the, the building code. If you're building a new building in Burlington in, in this time frame, like, you got to be building it as though it's going to be uh, a, a good player in this, in this net zero future. Um, and, and obviously, getting that district energy system uh, it makes it a lot easier to think about. Uh, you, know, you either have to bring some really interesting kind of technologies to someplace like the hospital to get it to be fossil fuel free, or you got to plug it into McNeil. Um, and uh, and so, really trying to figure out how to if you can plug it into McNeil sooner rather than later uh, is a is a really good important first step there. And and rate design again, you're getting at sending signals, but also uh, really rewarding people like that sixty cent uh, uh, sixty cent a gallon uh, bit that uh, that Darren talked about. So uh, some sense of what this looks like uh, in terms of, of the, the to-do list. And uh, we'll be around to, to help the, the city if there are any implementation issues or anything. Uh, always happy to come back and help. So uh, I'll, I'll turn the baton over to Jonathan to talk a little bit about uh, what this all looks like in transportation. Right, the short guy comes up here, and the local personality, I guess. Only <laughs> uh, so, so <laughs> thank you. Um, well, it is a pleasure to be here, and it's wonderful as a transportation planner and engineer to be here at an energy conference because it's uh, it's a coming of age, really, that now we're realizing that the. It was obvious on buildings and the energy generation sectors that now we got to look at the transportation sector. And it's wonderful that Vermont has taken the lead with the comprehensive energy plan that Darren was uh, was instrumental in, and then now at Burlington Electric taking on transportation as a key source of energy consumption and emissions. And um, it was really a pleasure to be participating and trying to identify some key actions and some high return on investment policies that the city can initiate to uh, meet our goals. 
So transportation, we already saw a slide how significant transportation was relative to fossil fuels. And so we're going to focus on these two markets and just discuss a little bit about the, the why. And so the why are all these emissions and energy. And so in Vermont, we see that transportation consumes 44% of our energy use and 53% of our emissions statewide. It's the largest component of our emissions and, uh, and it requires a new set of actions and a new set of cooperation among all the different parties. And so that's why we're happy to bring some of the transportation thinking uh, to it. And then uh, the first thing is that unleash the EVs. This is, this is the obvious question. When everybody looks at net zero energy, they said, all right, great, let's move everybody off fossil fuels. We, there are now adequate uh, substitutes available today um, if you have the cash to do so. And, so this is where this chart shows that we assume that there's going to be a trajectory, a growth of electric vehicles on the, let's see, oh, my red marker doesn't show up over there. But um, the growing share of EVs is, is expected to occur as the number of vehicles on the marketplace increases, as well as just then the cost parity um, goes down. By 2025, we expect that it would be generally equal to buy a new internal combustion engine car with a battery electric car. And we assume then by 2025, the sales percentages start going up dramatically. And uh, just to point out that by 2028, like what Darren said, excuse me, what um, Asa just said, the cash for clunkers kind of mentality sits in. 2028 is long term in this plan. And that's when we say we got to shift out all the inefficient internal combustion engines and get you into an EV. And that's the only way to reach some of these goals on the electrification side of transportation, uh, on the vehicle side, excuse me. And so that's, that's the easy answer. That's the electric vehicle side in a nutshell. And then we need to talk about the other methods, the other pieces that really are fundamental to how we are going to achieve these goals, and that's the behavioral change. And we brought to bear some tools and methodologies here to try to get an idea of what were the best policies that would be the most cost effective and have the highest return on the investment uh, for the city of Burlington to pursue. And so the way to do that is that we broke up these markets into these three different buckets. And we already described non-residential and residential that Darren already um, introduced. And this is just give a, a, a quick graphical representation. We have those people who live in Burlington and they happen to have vehicles. They happen to live in places that would have some options for walking, biking, et cetera. And then we have the, our school students who are taking buses both on the GMT and some school buses. And we have people who ride the buses around the city. So that's the non-residential uh, vehicles that are based in Burlington. And then we have non-Burlington vehicles. This is, this is just introducing our vernacular here. And these are the vehicles that, this is Main Street for those of you who do not live in Burlington on a typical weekday PM um, afternoon. And that's what uh, they face. This is, the, this is the, the crew that heads out of town every day. To introduce a little bit about who we are and what the scale of these, of these solutions might look like is that we have about 36,000 and change people employed in the city of Burlington and approximately 75% of them live outside of the city. We know that we have a big area of residential populations in South Burlington, nearby in Essex and Williston and Colchester, that that's our primary residential communities. And they themselves have added some, some workforce to them, but we still have UVM, UVM Medical, as well as some larger employers, dealer.com, et cetera, in the city of Burlington. So we hold down that core of employment for the region. And we realize that that's a market that we just don't have as much um, direct uh, ability to affect their behavior change. But we realize that policies do have um, trickle effects, and we'll just discuss a little bit about that in, in a second. So just a little bit of methodology, and this is where, as a transportation planner, I can get into this all day, but I wanted to introduce a little bit to you as energy professionals and people interested in this space, is that how do you start building up this idea of how do you develop policies in the transportation space? It's easy just to say, go walk somewhere, but in reality, we have these fixed constraints. We have policies, we have this land use, we have investments that we've built, roads that we've been built for years and years. And so it's not just as easy to make people change their behavior overnight. We've built up these, uh, this approach based on understanding travel behaviors at the household level, as understanding data from the school districts and GMT, and then we tried to understand how many people live and work, excuse me, how many people work in Burlington and what those typical behaviors look like at a daily uh, trip level basis. We then compared that kind of a, that was a bottom up approach. We kind of multiplied everything up by itself. How many people are here? What were the modes that they took? How long did they travel on average? And that's our bottom up analysis. We ground truth that 
by using this regional travel model. That's something that's available at the Chittenden County regional level. And that kind of said, that incorporates everything at a level, at a, at a citywide level, that says this is business does this, this household does this at a macro scale. And then we were able to kind of ground truth our bottom up approach with the top down and say, good, we're, we're in a reasonable level of confidence here. We're doing things right. And then that allowed us to pivot our solutions to focus, this is the household solution, this is the non-Burlington solution. Thinking about these solutions is that this is just a quick chart that shows that the, uh, the density in city of Burlington matters. When you're in the center core, your average trips re uh, reduce in, in a vehicle. You, you consume less vehicles on average in your, when your density increases and when your land use intensifies. At a more Chittenden County scale level, this is, a, this is a proxy. It's called block size. And this is a data set that RSG helped contribute to several years ago. But it shows that the density, the, the scale of the block size matters. And so the darker colors are showing where your block size are smaller. And that's where you have more opportunities to walk and bike and maybe scooter uh, and maybe take public transit in so that when you have your locations close to you, your errands, your friends, you have other modes and opportunities to travel. And then for those of us like myself, I live in Heinsberg, it's that giant wasteland south of there, I guess, in, in this map. And so we need to look at what other options do we have to travel, and that's the bus, the 15 mile category. So thinking about the solutions that we analyze, these are some of the ideas that are, are top of mind for most professionals. And now it's a question of understanding what are the effects of these? How relevant are these solutions for our population in Chittenden County? We have mode shifting. This is a nice urban setting. I don't know where, it's a, it's a fake graphic. But it shows bus lanes, and it shows these bike lanes, and it shows an urban city environment with, with 20 foot wide sidewalks. That would be great to be able to shift some people into more efficient modes. We have land use, 90% of our future land use, I don't know if Emily's here from the RPC, but 90% uh, of our planned growth is, is anticipated in these blue areas in the county, and towns have kind of signed up to change their, their local policies to support this, and 10% in the rest of the white area. We played with saying, what if we intensified that a little bit more, what would the effect be? And then transportation demand management, TDM is the, is the acronym uh, for those in the gig is that these are all tools that we have from carpooling, car sharing, we have these other investments that we can make in the city that would um, allow some people to make more efficient choices. And then we have parking. Typically it's $5 a day in the city of Burlington. What if we doubled that? And what would effect would that have? What if we doubled the amount of transit available to us in Chittenden County and tripled it even? We said, what would all these effects be? And then lastly, what would happen if we priced carbon? We ran a model here that's, that I, I do want to just quickly highlight, and there's hopefully a video here. I don't know if it will start. There it is. Uh, this is an innovative tool that has just been released. It's an open source software that, that RSG did help develop, and we've been running it now for a few regional councils around the country, from, from Seattle to Portland, Oregon. It was developed actually for an energy model for the state of Oregon, and that's where the, or, the origins uh, began. And now we were able to use it for the city of Burlington in this tool. And what it did is allow us to plug in all the specific demographics and land use and all these characteristics of our transit supply and calibrate it for the city of Burlington, actually Chittenden County. And then we were able to say what uh, levers would have the most effect for us. And then that would inform the pathways and strategies that we would recommend in this plan. So getting down to the, uh, to the nuts and bolts here is that where did we land? The time frame that we have, the 2030, meant that there really is no, uh, we had to pick options that all had value. We couldn't prioritize what was the low value versus the high value. So really it's an all hands on deck strategy. And that's where we said everything has some degree of value here. Everything is a positive ROI. And some of these things have uh, positive feedback loops, like the public transit investment. We know up front that'd be really expensive to do. But if you do it from earlier in the process, next year, if we doubled our transit supply, it would change our land use, it would change our behaviors in ways that, that we didn't analyze and model here, and it would have profound effects on our total energy consumption. So we wanted to promote efficient travel first and foremost. We wanted to increase dedicated capacity for pedestrians, bikes, and more efficient modes of, of travel. And then how can we dedicate specific lanes for that, particularly transit, for those 75% of people that are not gonna move all of a sudden to Burlington, how can we get them in and out of the city in the most efficient way? How can we make HOV lanes, for instance? 
We want to prioritize uh, TDM investments and focus on providing maybe free bus service, particularly in income sensitive, more incentivized so that we can improve transportation options for those um, who need it most. Then lastly, we want regulatory and utility leadership, and I kind of think of them together, but we have uh, regulatory settings that we have within the city. We're already reducing mandatory car parking uh, minimums for certain areas of Burlington, so we uh, will reduce. I don't know, it's in policy, I think in the city council right now, they're considering how that policy might look. We're also looking at expanding at EV charging requirements as part of any new residential development or commercial development. And then I think as a policy, we're supporting land use intensification within the city of Burlington and adjacent communities. And then lastly, the utility leadership here is that Burlington Electric has stepped up and done something unique. They're taking on these three aspects in the tier three framework of thermal transportation and, and electricity. And now, now BED can be an advocate for supporting sustainable transportation initiatives and be partners with the other um, utilities within the other departments within the city. So uh, it was a pleasure to be working on this and I hope that we continue to move the needle and push the city forward. So Thanks, thank you. Jonathan. So great, uh, Darren will now um, take this, hit us home. Okay. So th these next two slides cover our incentive programs uh, largely uh, through our tier three program uh, that you know, focus on electrification uh, across modes. Uh, we do EV rebates and incentives, plug-in hybrid EV uh, incentives. Uh, we have uh, EV charging incentives. We have e-bike rebates. We have electric bus incentives. Uh, two new electric buses coming to the Green Mountain Transit uh, Service Territory this month uh, with support from BED and uh, financing partnerships with our friends at VSCCU over there as well as others. Um, and then, so these were the existing incentives uh, prior to the roadmap. And as you can see, we have um, in many cases an enhanced incentive for our low and moderate income customers. Um, as part of the roadmap, we uh, bolstered a number of our programs and, and offered some new programs. Uh, for the first time, we've really taken uh, initiative uh, in partnership with Vermont Gas to offer incentives for cold climate heat pumps and a bonus incentive if you work with uh, Burlington Electric and Vermont Gas on weatherization. Uh, we have heat pump hot water incentives. Uh, we have electric forklift incentives, if anybody's interested, up to $6,500 for an electric forklift. Uh, Steve's here. We have electric lawnmower incentives uh, that are, are quite successful. Uh, uh, we've actually had close to about 150 uh, rebates for electric lawnmowers uh, just in the course of the last few months over the summer. Um, so we do believe, I think, in the electrify everything uh, that you can ethos that was discussed um, by Jules uh, at, the, uh, at the lunch. But the other piece I think that's really relevant here is obviously we could do all the good work we would want to do in Burlington or in the state of Vermont and not solve the climate change uh, emergency and not make the progress uh, that we need to make. So the thing that's powerful to me about what we're doing here is not just uh, the power of what we can accomplish, but the fact that there's a slide that's not been shown, which is if you get to the net zero energy goal the way that's been described by Asa and Jonathan uh, and through these slides, you'd be looking at a 65% increase in renewable electricity consumption in the city of Burlington. And that's even with a host of efficiency measures across all the different sectors. Uh, if we have that increase, which is very different than the trajectory we've been on, and we do so in a way where we're driving at least a portion of that, hopefully a good portion, off peak, uh, so it's not causing us to have to invest excessively in new infrastructure that we're using our existing infrastructure more efficiently, uh, that has a benefit in terms of downward rate pressure for every single ratepayer and customer uh, for Burlington Electric. So. I kind of want to end on that point uh, before we go to questions, which is I think what we're doing here, uh, not only in Burlington, but in the state of Vermont with all of the different utilities um, is going to be powerful, not just from an environmental standpoint, but if we are able to implement it well, uh, hopefully it'll be powerful from a customer standpoint and, uh, and something that other utilities around the country can look at and say that's something that we want to do as well. So I know we have maybe a little bit of time uh, for, for questions. I'll hand it back to Jim. Yeah, thank you. So um, I invite, fo well, first, actually, I want to thank our speakers. Can we get into the so thank you, Darren, Asa, and Jonathan. Um, so two modes. You can either use the app, of course, and um, share questions this way, or um, we welcome folks to just uh, stand up and use their voices. Um, and maybe as we wait for things to upload, let's see. There weren't any uh, just a few. Are there, there now? Yeah. I, 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 a, number, a number of them are answered by, a number of them. 
a, n a number of other questions have to do with what about transportation demand management? Uh, because the questions came in before Jonathan gave his presentation. Oh, I here think. we go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, what, uh, a couple of other questions about wood heat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I, I don't think we actually explicitly made a really conscious decision about wood heat um, so much as thinking about uh, you know, where the momentum is in Burlington's existing programs and, 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 and leveraging those pieces. Uh, the, uh, I think you know, so, some fraction of the buildings switching to uh, uh, re renewable electricity could be building switching to renewable wood heat, mm -hmm. uh, provided air quality and all the uh, re requirements are met. I, 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 so I, I think you could easily take uh, you, know, you, you similarly want to have the building shell improved. You similarly, you know, everything else is, is largely unchanged from that. Uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, you know, different different systems are going to make uh, different amounts of sense for different for different folks. Uh, for replacing a for replacing a boiler now, uh, you know, wood heat. Uh, given that that there aren't uh, are really a good available uh, heat pump to boiler hot water technologies, so, you know, if you're replacing a boiler, that that the wood heat might be a, a, a pretty mm -hmm. attractive option. Uh, if your if your boiler has 15 more years of life on it. Um, and, and you can add a heat pump to, to, to decarbonize uh, dramatically today, right? Then, you know, then you, you're in a different, uh, different lever there. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Asa. And I see, um, oh, I just lost it on my phone. Do you see those questions, Jonathan? There was a question about um, why the emphasis on um, single occupancy vehicles and switching those over to electric as opposed to spending more of our effort on alternative yeah. modes of transit? Yeah, I think uh, quick just to comment about that is that hope I don't know whether I, we address that or not, but just some comments there is there were some, I think, uh, reasonable skepticism looking at saying only 5% of our energy is related to alternative transportation. And the reality is, is that with by 2030, we didn't model any effect of shifting people who currently live out in Hinesburg of me moving into the city of Burlington. We said, what is the amount of growth that we have over the next 11, 12 years? And said, how would the change be between today and tomorrow if we pushed people in using alternative forms of transportation? And so today we did model, said, all right, what if we doubled tra public transit today? The reality is, is that our land use and our jobs are largely already fixed, and the amount of riders are not going to scale linearly if we double or triple our capacity of the public transit system, for instance. So that's, a, that's an example of why the magnitude of energy savings uh, was relatively small uh, in some of that alternative transportation piece. But I, as, I, as I said at the podium there is that some of these things have feedback loops that we can't, that we can't quite appreciate or model um, without, uh, without a lot more intensive, uh, intensive um, system. And that if we were to triple transit service tomorrow, I think by 2030, there would be profound changes in our land use. Uh, so it didn't, it didn't say what happens if you do it in first year versus last year. We only modeled kind of last year effects and said, if you did it in 2030, what would be the overall effect? So hopefully, um, it, it, it aligns with another question that I'll just quickly take on, is that what would a community do without a, without a local u mm -hmm. electric utility? And in the transportation space, all of these investments are uh, what we said, no regrets. You would have positive immediate return on any EV that you subsidize. You would then have immediate positive community benefits for any public transit that you incentivize for health, environmental emissions, et cetera. And then you also have these other land use and health effects that have been uh, documented uh, substantially uh, at length when you increase your diversity and density of land use. And so all of these things would have profound benefits well above, above and beyond maybe what was you know, documented there in something um, in this report. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, Patty. Can you talk about, so from neighboring energy committees who are trying to work you know, with their cities, uh, can you give us an idea human hours that have gone into this? Has it come more from the top down and we're doing this? Or is it the residents that are pushing for this to happen? How many people are on the ground every day working on this issue and these goals? And how could this be rolled out you know, to your neighbors um, mm -hmm. to do this sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Do you want to? 
talk about that, Darren? Sure, yeah. Um, could all the BED folks who are in the room just raise their hand real quick? So we've, everybody who's raising their hand is part of, uh, and there are more who are not here, uh, essentially part of the net zero energy effort. I mean, we're, we're really thinking of it as a, an entire utility effort, but there is a core of, of team, essentially, which uh, Jen was the project manager for the net zero roadmap, uh, kind of day to day managing the relationship with our different consultants and uh, coordinating all the different feedback uh, from, from our team. And, and uh, we're going to have a process going forward where we're going to probably have uh, 10 to 12 people at the utility from leadership and from the, the uh, frontline team coordinating on a regular basis to track our progress towards these metrics. Um, and it's not just the utility. It's, it's uh, very much a department uh, by department uh, initiative as well. The mayor's had intense interest in this and been uh, strongly supportive. Uh, the planning and zoning for the city, the Department of Public Works, uh, Parks and Rec, a number of different departments are, are taking on pieces of this. Um, and then just kind of uh, from the resident standpoint, we have done surveys of our customers and asked about, uh, this was prior to the roadmap, but asked about general support for the net zero energy goal and roughly 95% of respondents are in favor of our taking this on. Um, Jen and I are going to all the different NPAs in the community, all the neighborhood planning assemblies. We've started uh, with one meeting previously. We've got another this evening. Uh, so we're going around and getting, I think, generally supportive feedback uh, from the community about this. Um, but I do want to give credit um, for at least initiating this process, really, uh, to the mayor for having the uh, the will to say we're going to take on this goal, we're going to actually take it seriously, we're going to invest time and resources into it, we're going to work with all of our different departments, not just the utility. And I do think that in communities that don't have a municipal utility, we're fortunate to have utilities all across the state that are committed. Every single utility in the state of Vermont is offering EV rebates, uh, for example, and helping customers make these types of changes. Um, I do think cities have a power to lead by example you know, with our own fleets, with our own buildings, with our own heating systems, and uh, I think that that's an option as well beyond the items Jonathan mentioned that are available to communities around Vermont. The, yes, please, Paul. I, um, I'm curious, Jonathan, if you were able to model uh, eliminating the parking lot and building high-density affordable housing, and what Burlington Electric might be able to do to support that type of investment. So, Paul, help me out. Uh, in terms of the modeling, you know, it, the I'm not clear on the actual question on the transportation side. Can you help me out? Well, if you build affordable housing and create places for people who currently drive until they can afford to live, but they work in Burlington, and you create a space for them to live in Burlington, you eliminate drivers. Yeah. So, can you model that? Yeah, I think we can. We have. Uh, the, the tool there actually has a whole, it's, it's a representation of the full Burlington and county population. So we have income sensitivity is built into this model. And so that's why some of the responses to some of the initiatives are varied. And we could, uh, all, by all means, play with the analysis and understand, say, if we were to incentivize certain populations and look at the transportation effect, uh, you know, at a kind of a macro scale and then on, on an individual level, I think it'd be almost easier to say, this is the real dollars and cents that could be saved by an individual if they had the opportunity to, to change where they lived. Yes, please. How did you factor in the, the effect of the student population in your goals? That, you know, think, thinking of the student population as a, as a portion of the renter population, basically. Uh, you know, on the, on the buildings analysis side, I mean, that gets to the strategies piece is that's one of the reasons why the regulatory levers and other things show up pretty quick and early in this process is to as a as a as a way in a reasonably short period of time to get over landlord tenant type questions around the side of somebody who owns the building and somebody else is paying the bills um, and uh, uh, you know, you can. There, there, you know, there are there are definitely good things that have been done on the incentive front, and you know, BED and VGS have done good, good, good work in getting landlords to sort of step up through incentive type routes. But at the level of trying to get, you know, nearly every building to do something in a relatively short period of time, um, we had we identified that 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 bringing those regulatory levers to bear um, is an important uh, thing to think about. And, and just to add on to that, Patty. Um, 
We, uh, this week actually, the city council voted on a set of reforms that uh, from our side, from Burlington Electric, Jen and Chris Burns were working on, uh, which among them, there's some affordable housing work and other types of things, but there's a, a proposal to have broad energy efficiency standards across all rental housing implemented over the next several years. So we've, we've had a time of sale ordinance that's captured a portion of buildings as they go through a sale process and required upgrades, um, but this would be a much more expansive uh, use of regulation, really a first kind of uh, use of the regulation in the ways that were envisioned in the roadmap to really help broaden those efficiency standards and help students, help renters, and, and others. We have time for one more question. I can pull from the phone or please. So you talked a bit about um, you know trans uh, transit expansion, and that generally means you know more buses. But as I've been recently educated by some local uh, community organizers in, in the Harvard area around advanced transit expansions, that running buses when people aren't on them is highly uh, in, in an effective way, not not efficient way to move people around. So looking at expanding ride share services and making uh, uh, those kinds of things available for the uh, weekends and evenings when the ridership tends to not justify having the buses on the road. Um, and something that uh, your, what, what drove me to this question was your, uh, your transition graph talked about number of vehicles on the road, number of electric vehicles on the road, but I think uh, in my experience the more important metric is you know, percentage of, vehicle, of passenger miles traveled uh, is the transition metric and so the, the things that are missing from that graph are uh, ride share services particularly automation. We're talking about Tesla being ready to operate in Burlington as early as next year with a fully autonomous taxi service. Uh, in, in the snow, in bad weather, everything. So, uh, you know, they'll expand out in more rural areas with their technology in the coming years, not decades, right? So what's missing from your transition graph is that taking advantage of that technology. And I wonder if you've got any thoughts around how you might uh, model that for when it hits and be prepared for that transition as well. Yeah, there. Um, we've been working with. Uh, I don't even know if this is on. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. <laughs> we we've been working with uh, in separate contexts. We've been working with different OEMs and also the Regional Planning Commission on modeling what would affect with with increased automation. And frankly, it's it's going to be increasing VMT. And so, but VMT, the vehicle miles traveled, was our metric when we analyzed everything here. And we were able to understand that the average per capita uh, vehicle is driven about 8,000 miles today in the city of Burlington. And with these um, opportunities to offer alternatives to driving, we were able to show that that average VMT could go down in the future. And so some of that had to do with a suite of options. And it was kind of in this bucket, but it included microtransit, which is kind of the, the on-demand ride sharing and within the city of Burlington. So all of those things were part of the puzzle. None of them were anal analyzed with the level of, of detail as that particular microtransit solution reduced the VMT by two, you know, 10, 5% or something. It was a bucket of saying this, this particular population, because of the density and diversity of land uses, they had the opportunity to shift modes. And so it gave that relative boundary effects. So that's what we basically modeled in this study. And that in the strategy section in the report, if you go to the website online, you can fee see some very explicit examples to say, invest in this, study this, do that. Great, thank you. So I think we, we're, we're getting the indication that we're up here. I, I, I believe our uh, panelists will be on hand for a few minutes following the presentation if you had any other questions. and. Uh, Really wanted to thank Darren, Asa, and Jonathan for joining us today and for your participation. Thank you so much. <laughs>